Hey guys, in these series of videos I'll be taking you through to subtopic 2.2 and specifically I'll be covering ionic bonding. These are going to be the learning objectives for the first video. So we're going to learn how to predict the charge of a monatomic ion and we're also going to learn how to write the electron configurations for monatomic ions formed from the first 38 elements. So this is our first science understanding. Uh, valence electrons are transferred from a metallic atom to a non-metallic atom to form ions and ionic bonding is the force of attraction between oppositely charged ions. What we need to be able to do is then predict the charge on the monatomic ion formed from an element, uh, formed by an element, using its position in the periodic table. So a bit about ions. Uh, they are formed from atoms or they can form from group, uh, groups of atoms as well, which we call molecules. And these atoms or groups of atoms lose or gain electrons to try and achieve a stable electron configuration. And uh, we call this a stable valence configuration. And when that happens, they can either become positively or negatively charged. And we have specific names for uh, oppositely charged ions. To better understand this idea of how atoms can lose or gain electrons, what we often do is we look at the, what we call the electron dot diagram for a particular atom. And this just takes into account only the valence electrons in that particular element. So what we can see here is we've got the first 20 elements and we're just representing the number of valence electrons in each of those elements. So hydrogen here, uh, which happens to be in group one, and we know that group one uh, elements contain only one valence electron. So lithium and sodium and potassium also only contain one valence electron. We go over to the next group and we've got beryllium here with two, we've got magnesium with two and calcium with two. And we can just follow this through. When we get beyond uh, group four with the carbon and silicon, what we start to notice is that these valence electrons, they start to pair up. And one thing for you to just know is that the electrons like to pair up. So we eventually go into the other groups and we can see the number of valence electrons corresponds to its group number. The only exception would just be helium here, uh, which has two valence electrons, but it's in group eight. So if we need to predict the charge of an ion, uh, what we actually use is essentially what group number it belongs to, and that then indicates the number of valence electrons. So we can use this and then determine and predict the likelihood of those atoms to gain or lose those electrons. And just as a bit of a, of a reminder, this just helps link these two ideas together, so the group number with the number of valence electrons. Atoms will usually lose or gain electrons to try and ensure its valence shell is full or stable. Uh, this usually does correspond to eight electrons in the valence shell, and it's what we commonly refer to as the octet rule. But keep in mind that this only applies to atoms with a low atomic number. So at the moment, we're only talking about elements one through to 20, and this does apply for these uh, elements in most cases. There are going to be a couple of exceptions to that as well. So I've got here from hydrogen through to boron. This, uh, this octet rule doesn't apply for these particular uh, low atomic number elements. And just going back to this uh, image here, so we know that the number of valence electrons helps determine the number of electrons that can be lost or gained. So if we think about the group one elements here, and hydrogen somewhat does also uh, get classified in the same group. We know that it is generally much easier for these particular elements to lose one electron so that their valence shell is now full. So for example, sodium has one valence electron in its third electron shell. So it could simply lose that one electron here and it would end up with a similar electron configuration to neon. And we know that neons valence shell is full. Alternatively, if we have a look at a non-metal, so for something like oxygen, so it has six valence electrons, it does have an option to either lose six electrons or it can gain another two electrons to fill up that valence shell. Out of the two, it is much easier to gain two electrons as opposed to lose six. So oxygen will gain two electrons and it will achieve the same octet configuration of neon. So the word monatomic ion, it means it's an ion composed of just one atom. So an atom has lost or gained electrons to become either positively or negatively charged. 
In general, metal atoms tend to lose electrons, and because they lose electrons which are negatively charged, they become positively charged. And we call a positively charged ion a cation. The way I like to think of this is that cation has a T, and a T looks very similar to a positive sign. So cation, that T means positive. Non-metal atoms, on the other hand, tend to gain electrons, and electrons being neg negatively charged, uh, it's going to result in a negatively charged ion. And an anion is the name of the negatively charged ion. And the way that I think about this, and you might want to get this down, is that anion stands for a negative ion. So it's pretty simple, um, but hopefully this is something that can help you distinguish between cations and anions. So let's have a look at uh, a few examples. We're going to start off with sodium here, and uh, I believe we have just covered this uh, already. We can see its uh, basic electron configuration here. So we've got uh, an electron configuration of 2, 8, 1, 2 electrons in the first shell, 8 in the second, and third in, uh, sorry, 1 in the third shell, uh, or in its valence shell. So we would see that it is generally easier for sodium to lose that one valence electron here, and as a result, it becomes positively charged, given that sodium has 11 protons. So now it has only 10 electrons, it becomes positively charged, and we call it a sodium ion. On the other hand, if we have a look at oxygen here, so its electron configuration is 2.6 in the, in the basic way. So oxygen will like to gain two electrons, and so when it does that, it gains a two negative charge. The um, name of the ion now, it's not called an oxygen ion. For the non-metals, we actually uh, changed the name. It's now be, uh, called an oxide ion. So we look to try and take the first syllable of the element, and then we end it in "-ide". That's, that's usually the case that we find. So uh, another example would be chlorine turns into chloride. Uh, sulfur turns into sulfide. We'll just have to keep in mind how many electrons get gained, and that will determine the charge on the ion. So we've got an example of various cations here. So we had a look at sodium, but now we've got other ones like lithium, magnesium, and calcium. And I've just shown you here the atoms and then the ions that they make up. And you can see in each case, they've actually lost electrons in that valence shell so that they end up now with a full or stable outer shell of electrons. Uh, and each of these are positively charged, so the way to name them is just the name of the element followed by the word ion or cation. Anions, on the other hand, so remember that the name of the ion actually changes from the element, so we take the first syllable and then we add ide to the end of it. So fluorine becomes fluoride, chlorine becomes chloride, and in this specific case, these non-metal atoms have gained electrons in the valence shell to become stable, and as a result become negatively charged. We can summarize this information in this table here. So this covers most of the uh, first 20 elements, and it shows you what charge these particular atoms generally form when they turn into ions. So hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on, all in group one, they all form ions with a one positive charge. Group two ions, and there are a few exceptions, but if we have a look at magnesium and calcium, as well as the others, group two, so two valence electrons, they'll lose two electrons, and they'll form an ion with a two positive charge. Aluminium's in group three, so it forms a three positive charge ion. And then we go over to this side here, so going from group five, nitrogen forms a nitride ion with a three negative charge. Oxygen forms oxide with a two negative, as well as sulfur with the sulfide ion. And then we've got our halogens here, which turn into what we call halides. So fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide, all with a one negative charge. A few things we have to keep in mind is that group four atoms don't really form ions, and that's generally because they like to share electrons instead. So they don't end up becoming overall positively or negatively charged. And generally we'll say that the group eight um, atoms, they don't form any ions because they already have stable electron configurations. If we want to name ions, I've covered this already, but just keep in mind, we just name the atom followed by the word ion or cation, 
So we've got various examples here that we've uh, already gone through. If we look at anions on the other hand, so like I said, you take the first syllable of the name of the element or of the atom and then follow it by the suffix "-ide", um, and then you end that in ion or anion. So again, we've got various examples here that show you how we name the ions. And I've just underlined the fact that we end it in the suffix "-ide". 